I am thrilled to invite Emily Penton of Inner Clarity System onto the show today. I am so grateful to Emily for her open, honest interview with me, where she's talking about her personal journey with bipolar disorder and eating a carnivore diet and how that has completely, she has not had a bipolar episode in years. So that is very exciting. So of course, I always want to have information on the show that gives you a fresh perspective to mental health and things that we don't always think about. But I do want to add a trigger warning to this particular episode. So of course, podcasts, we are not giving any advice here. It's certainly not medical advice, and it's not a consultation. But in this episode, Emily, is, who's just lovely, she shares very honestly about her journey through forgiveness. And she has a very interesting perspective on what she used to go through some deep forgiveness in her life. So some of you may find that triggering, what she's talking about to be triggering. So I wanted to just put that warning out there that every single healing journey is personal and that all of us, all healing is inner healing. And so you can't walk anybody else's journey. You can't go on somebody else's path, but we can be inspired by other people's paths. And so that's the purpose here on the Nourished Soul podcast. And so we're grateful to Emily and just want to put out there that you just put listen with tender ears and take good care of yourself. And if you're feeling triggered, please then do stop listening and take really good care of yourself. Reach out to a professional if you feel like you need to do that. So I hope that you enjoy listening to Emily as much as I enjoyed talking with Emily. Emily, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to talk to you. Hey, I'm so excited to talk to you too. And it's it's com a completely different experience for me because I'm so used to interviewing with people that I've never met in real life. And so to have got to really spend time with you in real life in uh, Tennessee and then get to do this now, it's just, it's like old friends. It's so fun. It is. It's like old friends. And I loved, I'm glad you brought up Meat Stock where we actually met in person. It's because I had followed, I was following you and had heard a little bit, but just meeting you in person, like you're just such a vibrant human being and a bright light. So your story is very inspiring. Obviously, everybody wants to hear your story, but it's just so nice that we got to spend time and get to know each other. And it was a great setting to be able to do that. So. Oh my gosh, that was amazing. It really was. And not what I expected. I don't oh, know really? what I expected from meat stock, but I didn't expect mm -hmm it to be like on 10, like the mm -hmm. environment, the people, the conversations, the content, like the energy. I, I don't know if it was just a, a, a perfect storm of the people and the the trees, um, but it was just such an incredible event, such an incredible event. It was really an incredible experience. And I think it was mostly, I mean, the trees are were amazing too, mostly the people. I really do think it was, and I think Scott's vision, I won't speak for him too much, but I think his vision was, we're all together, we're all eating, we're all talking, and you get to hang out with really cool people, and that's exactly what happened. So we got to hang out, and that was really great. So I think a lot of people are very interested in the weight loss and the physical part of your story, just to watch your transformation. But I think the more important piece is the mental health piece. And so I really wanted, we can talk about whatever parts you want to talk about, but the mental health part, I think is so important for people to understand and all the things that you were doing and that you tried and how badly you were feeling before you kind of found your way out of that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I do have a bit of a unique perspective because I got to play both sides of the role in that I was a mental health professional. And then I became 
mentally ill. <laughs> and so to, to have both of those, because if you look at it, most people who go in to study psychology, um, they're trying to figure out themselves and they're yeah. trying to yeah. figure out their family tree. <laughs> um, and so I actually was, wasn't diagnosed until grad school. I was in grad school when I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and it was one of those manageable um, mental illnesses where I would have really good years and I would have really good months and then I would, you know, crash and burn. Um, and I was able to manage it, manage it in that I didn't commit suicide and I didn't end up in the psych ward right. um, with meds. Um, so the meds didn't manage it. The ma the meds kept me alive and kept me out of the psych ward. Mm -hmm. um, very effective though. I, I was able to, to keep that stability. Um, but then in the end of 2018, um, unfortunately, it turned into rapid cycling. Um, so I didn't know who I was from one day to the next. It was like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And then obviously that became unethical for me to practice. So um, I had to close the doors on the private practice and I was homeless. I, uh, I moved in with my mom at the age of 40 and um, I went into this way of eating, not caring about my physical body at all. It was my brain. It was all about my brain. And no one had told me that it's possible that the ramen noodles and the donuts and the pizza and the beer and the ice cream was contributing to the inflammation in my brain. Um, and I didn't know until I knew. And in um, February of 2019, I went being very bipolar. I went overnight and I just stopped eating all of the, the stuff I just mentioned. And I ate only fatty animal meat. And I thought it would just improve things. I had no clue it would mitigate it. Um, right. And my, my last bipolar episode was April of 2019. My psychiatrist, I stayed with him for over two years, um, even after he prescribed the last med, but he tapered me off of 900 milligrams of lithium, 80 milligrams of Prozac, 80 milligrams of Adderall and Ambien to sleep every night. And so my last mm. psych med was September of 2019 and, um, getting my brain back and my mental clarity was everything. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. And yeah, there's something about when you're in the mental health industry and you know that you're hanging by a thread it, there's so much for me, I'll just speak. There's just so much, um, shame attached to that. And like, I should know better. I should be able to get this under control. And I don't, I don't know for your experience, it just, it had to be excruci excruciatingly difficult to close the doors on your private practice. Yeah. Well, and, and at first it made me more effective because I was able to relate. I wasn't sitting there going, how does that make you feel? Right. You know, I was like, oh, I remember that. This sucks. You know, blah, blah, blah. This is what I've done that's helped me. But whenever the modalities didn't help me, I was just like, I'm not going to keep peddling this false hope if it's not helping me. And then once, once I did realize that it was the inflammation in my brain, I went back to private practice in June of 2019. And I realized that the insurance panels and the licensing board did not want me talking about food. Um, I know. Isn't and it I crazy? Unbelievably crazy. Yeah. That we can't talk about the relationship between mood and food, mood not just mood, but mental health in general and food is unbelievable to me. And I, I just was like, well, I'm going to. So I, because when I became a nutritional therapist, I just was interested in gut health. Like I just felt like intuitively it made sense to me that gut health was related to our brain health. 
and that everybody should really know that. But I don't think I didn't really dig deep into inflammation and understanding inflammation until sometime later. And then I got mad. I don't know if you, I mean, I was really angry that we, I was an edu a counselor educator too, and a professor in counseling, and we were not teaching, you know, we're so worried about the stupid national board exam, which I get you have to pass so that you can get licensed. And we're so worried about helping people get through the hoops that we're not actually equipping them with the information that's going to be the most powerful for their clients and for their own health. They're going to burn out if they don't have the modalities only take you so far. That is going to create a problem for the practitioners, not just for the clients. And so much burnout. I mean, I could not believe behind closed doors how much burnout there was among my colleagues and my mentors, you know? I mean, I was just like, what, <laughs> you know? And to, to be totally honest with you, if you sit there and you look at all of the information that we're pushing out to the clients, if they're not able to apply it, we're, we're literally wasting our breath and we're wasting their time. And it is unethical for me to charge them knowing that they are, they're sitting there with like their eyes glossed over, like elbow deep in a bag of Doritos, sipping on a big gulp, like, huh? Like mm -hmm. they can't hear the modality that I'm explaining. They can't do the exercises that I'm presenting to them because their brain is chock full of inflammation. Right. And so it's a broken model. Yeah. And I was finding the same thing. Even when I did start teaching it to my students, they were elbow deep into Doritos bags while we're in class. I and know. I was like you can't learn this. Like you're not going to be able to get, you don't get it. And it's, it's this tricky, it's tricky. So once you do realize that this is all inflammation and it's brain inflammation, well, it's inflammation, not just in the brain, it's everywhere at that point, everything is connected, our physical, our emotional, our mental health, it's all connected, right? But the way out, so how did you come across carnivore? Because you started, did you start carnivore, keto? Like, where were you like, hey, maybe I'll try this crazy thing and see if it helps me? Um, mine was very divine appointment, um, and very spiritual, uh, experience. There was no logic. Um, there was no Emily read a scientific journal article and Emily deducted that this was going to be the best, you know, choice. Nah, no, uh, it was my brother. Um, and my brother, I've talked about this on interviews before. My brother's a jerk. Um, he's not nice. Um, and he reached out and he gave me this information and it was acknowledging my mental illness and offering a solution. And so I was like, oh, my brother acknowledging me and offering to help me like I'm listening. And so I, I was just so grateful that he, he did. And he sent me, um, the first chapter of Amber O'Hearn's book mm -hmm. and it was just on audio. And I, I literally laid in the bathtub and that's all I could do. I just laid in the bathtub and I listened to the first chapter and it was just like this spiritual click, this like connection of hope where she had had bipolar disorder for 10 years prior to that. And she experienced this mental clarity. And I was like, you're telling me there's a chance, you know, if this helped this woman, I will do anything to get even an ounce of relief from bipolar disorder. And so that was my goal is to just get relief. I had no idea it was going to go away. Like that's just unheard of. You don't get over bipolar disorder. It doesn't go away. Right. I, well, I hear this over and over again, though. I started interviewing people just with all kinds of mental health issues that had started eating fatty meat. And then some of them were still including certain things at first, coffee and a little of this or a donut every now and then or whatever it was. But they already had enough improvement to say, wait a minute, I, this doesn't make sense. But I love that it was 
divine. I love that it was in a spiritual experience. I, I you know, hate that you got to the place. Hate's probably a strong word. I, it, I, it hurts my heart to know that you got to a place where like all you could do was lay in the bathtub. You're on major medication, Tr like rapid cycling is just, that's a rough, rough road. And so to find any hope that that's beautiful in and of itself. And then how long did it take for you to start feeling better? And what were the symptoms? If you don't mind like sharing, what was the worst of the times and then what started improving? Uh, the worst was the, the cloud, um, of just doom, um, and, uh, being so disappointed every morning that I woke up, oh, yeah. I just, I just wanted it to be over. Um, I, I, I never got to the point where I had a plan, um, to take my own life, but I, I just didn't want to live. I was just like game over, like, come on. I don't want to, I don't want to see what tomorrow looks like. Um, and so that heaviness every day, day in and day out, uh, is just like, you can't even plan for the future. Cause you don't want to plan for the future. Cause you don't want the future to come. Like I didn't want to plan for tomorrow because I, I really hope tomorrow doesn't happen. Um, and then for me personally, I see it as a lens. And so everything that I saw was through this bipolar lens and, um, my situation, like Somebody would say, um, it's a nice day outside. And I wouldn't hear it's a nice day outside. I would hear it's a nice day outside. Why aren't you outside? What are you doing? Why didn't you clean the car? Why, why are you just sitting on the couch? You know, what are you doing with your life? Like, but that's what I hear. Like everything was Emily is horrible. Emily is a loser. Emily is a failure. And I only saw life through that lens. And um, it you asked the timeline. So I started April 24th of 2019. Um, my last like full-blown episode of, of bipolar or uh, of manic or depression was in April of 2019. But four weeks in to eating this way, I had a glimpse of hope. And it was only 10 minutes, but it was so foreign that I was like, what is that? Like, what is this emotion of joy, of, of excitement about the future? And then it was only 10 minutes. It went away. And I was like, huh, I was like, that was cool. And then the next day it was 15 minutes. And I was just like, no way this happened two days in a row. And then it just grew and grew and grew until it got to the point near the end of April where I was just experiencing joy and hope. And then I started planning for my future. And that's when my psychiatrist was like, Emily, do you hear yourself? Like you're excited about next month. You're excited about what you're going to do. And that's whenever I realized that there was a huge significant shift. And I was like, I ain't going back to the pit of mental illness hell ever. It's not worth it. Right. So were you all meat? Have you, do you stay all meat the whole time? Yeah. Um, the, the blessing with bipolar disorder is we go all in. We go hardcore. We just jump. We're a rip the bandaid off kind of a person. Um, and so I didn't even play with, um, eggs or dairy or butter or anything. I just went animal meat and animal fat because I wanted a pure experiment. I wanted to know, you know, what I was reacting to. Um, and in hindsight, I realized that, um, that was, I believe in my higher self guiding me because I didn't know that what I had lurking underneath the surface was multiple sclerosis as well. And so I, I realize now that that was so beautiful that I had this pure experiment and that I was able to stay on that track of just eating animal meat and animal fat. 
um, mm -hmm. because it ended up mitigating my symptoms of multiple sclerosis as well. Amazing. So I had a couple things. I just wanted to make sure that people understand if they're not carnivore, they're not, they don't know this whole world of like what we mean by meat. We just mean literally from an animal. It doesn't have to be beef. Mm -mm. Chicken, um, pork. Um, I would eat uh, fish, um, you know, ribs, breakfast sausage, uh, brisket, um, everything, chicken wings. Yeah. Um, my main focus was fatty. Okay. I had to have chicken with the skin on. I had to have, um, you know, like the, the, um, the, the visible fat on the brisket or on the steak. Um, I made a point to eat animal fat. Right. And I think that's important. MS autoimmune issues. We really need that fat. We need the fat to, to make our hormones. We need the fat for every cell in the body. I mean, we just really, that's very healing. So, but I do think everybody has to play with this um, because you stayed away from eggs and dairy. Some people can add eggs and dairy that comes from an animal. So it's a, it's really more of a trial and error, but I love that you had this pure experience and that it was, you saw hope, you saw light, it kept getting more and more to keep you on it. At what point did you start realizing, I mean, was your psychiatrist going, this can't be happening. And when did you start trying to wean off of the medication? How was that? Um, that was actually him. Um, he, he was just like, Emily, he was like, you're doing so good. Um, and I was just like, okay, okay. Like I've been so completely mentally ill for so long. Like I just wanted to keep my security blanket like, let's just keep the meds. Let's just be happy that Emily's functioning, happy that Emily's back to working full time, knocking it out of the park. Like, can we just be stable for a minute? And he was like, you can. He was like, but I can see where we need to titrate some of this. And so he got me in the the tiny movements. And so I was just like, okay. And so then the next month he was like, okay, let's just go a little bit. And for me personally, in the past, any time we did a med change, it was like, I could feel the boat rocking. Like I was just like chaos. And every time we titrated the meds, I didn't even notice it. Oh, like, that's amazing. I, I wasn't like, and I would be like gripping the sides of the boat, like, okay, all right. We, we did a, a med change. Oh, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. I didn't even feel that. No rocking, I, no chaos, just a, no bad day. Right. Even with the Adderall, because that's some people have a really hard time coming off all those meds, but like that Adderall can really kick people's butt. Um, Adderall was a little bit of a different situation. Okay. <laughs> totally. I, I want to disclose this completely because yeah. um, I don't want people to think that it's easy to get off Adderall. Um, Adderall happened whenever I was hospitalized with, uh, multiple sclerosis. Um, and I actually don't think that the doctor made a healthy choice for me, but he took me off Adderall from 80 milligrams to nothing in one day. And it was very painful. <laughs> it was very, very painful, but I was in the hospital. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't advise anybody to ever do that. Um, I don't know how ethically this doctor was able to do that. Um, but he said, you have MS, you shouldn't be on Adderall. And he took me off that day. Um, and so, um, in retrospect, looking back, that's, that was very dangerous. That, that could have put me into a uh, hundred different very bad situations, but I'm glad that it happened because it was done. Once I got out of the hospital, I was in the hospital for seven days, nine days, something like that. Mm -hmm. I was off. I was off. So, uh, it worked out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then <laughs> alrighty then.
Yeah, that isn't a typical story, but what were the symptoms that brought you into the hospital? Were you, did you already know about MS? Were you like, okay. No, I, I can look back over 10 years and I can see the symptoms of MS. So I had it the whole time. I just didn't know it didn't have a name. It wasn't there. Um, but the, the reason that I went to the hospital was I had acute dysphagia where my throat just stopped swallowing. I couldn't even swallow water. Mm. And they did the, um, I think it's called a swallow test or barium swallow. I don't know. They did some kind of test right. and found out it was not mechanical. It was neurological that my brain was not communicating with my throat to swallow. They did the MRI, they found the lesions, they did the lumbar puncture, um, and they diagnosed me with MS. So a logical person would say, oh, I started this all meat diet uh, three weeks ago, and now I'm hospitalized and I've got MS, but there was this spiritual knowing that it wasn't that the, the meat diet caused the MS, it pulled back the curtain and revealed the MS. Mm -hmm. And the answer was still anti-inflammatory foods. The answer was not to go back to ramen noodles and pizza, right? You know, the answer was right. keep going, keep going, keep going. And then May 9th of 2019 was my last MS episode. Like you don't oh. get over this stuff. It's crazy. Right. Were you ever to the point where you, where you felt it, like, I'm, I'm imagining like fatigue, not being able to walk and exercise and all of the things. Yeah. Um, I would get bouts of fatigue. Like I said, you don't know until you know, mm -hmm. and no one had ever said the word MS. So I had never researched it. Um, every time I had gone to the doctor, they're like, oh, you're just getting old. You're just getting old. And I'm like, I'm 40. Like yeah. I'm not getting old. Um, but, uh, yeah, it actually, actually got worse before it got better. And, um, there were days that, um, I couldn't walk without an assistive device right. and I would go to the kitchen and I would have to sit on a stool to sit there and flip my steak. And then I would eat the steak and I would have to go back to bed. I mean, I was just wiped out. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I started having delayed and slurred speech. So like, I would tell my kid, go take a bath and it would come out, go take a bath. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. And then my brain fog was worse than it ever was with bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. Um, so it definitely got bad. Um, and, um, I remember they, I would go to, a uh, occupational therapy, and they would have me squeeze the little things. They'd measure my grip. And I couldn't even, I couldn't even make it budge. I couldn't even make it move. I had no ability to grasp in my hands. And then my legs wouldn't work either. I was in a, I was literally using a walker. Yeah. Bad situation. And yet you were still hopeful and you had some. You just had a knowing that this fatty meat was helping you. I think that's pretty remarkable. Well, and if I look back now, mm -hmm. that had to happen first mm -hmm. to get to, because if, if I had been mentally ill and not able to walk, like, oh my gosh, but because I had gotten four weeks under my belt and I was experiencing joy, I was like, screw it. Like, I don't care. Let's go. Like, I was able to keep pushing through whatever I needed to push through. And thankfully it was the right choice for MS as well. Um, so I, I think it was all divine appointment and it was exactly as it should be. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. When you follow though, I think we all have that divine information and that intuition, that clarity can come. I'm just surprised at how, even in myself, we dismiss it often and think it's something else or keep pushing what we've been told, because I can imagine you've been told a lot of things about what to do and the way we're educated as mental health professionals, like this is none of this was a part of our education. No, not at all. And, you know, for me personally, I 
I got kind of bullied by the uh, neurologist um, because mm-hmm. he was like, this is what you do. And then you start injecting yourself every other day with this medication. And thankfully I had enough, you know, clarity that I was like, um, no, I'm not going to do that. And he was just like, but you can't walk. And I was like, I know, I know it sounds crazy, but, uh, um, I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm not supposed to do that. And I just stuck to my gun and I took the biggest gamble of my life. And it's still a gamble. I mean, you still can look at many symptom, many uh, cases of MS where it comes back. Um, but for now, I've taken the gamble of not taking the medication. And so far, it's paying off. It's been over five years since I've had a, an MS incident. And my last MRI showed no MS activity. I was well, like, I that's incredible. I know. And I'm just like, okay, all right. I'm just going to stay here. Yeah. But you're also somebody who stays very open. So if you had a different message come through or if something spoke to you, I, I don't feel like you would be like, no, it's clear because that's your whole business too is inner clarity, right? This is what you do. This is how you help people. And so I don't feel like you're one of those people that closes off really anything, but you check it out with yourself and there's that inner knowing of like, this might be work for other people. I'm not saying something's wrong with you. I'm saying for me, we're not doing that right now. Exactly. And that's my (laughs) clients get so mad at me whenever they come to work with me and they're like, okay, I want a food plan. And what do you think about this medication? And what do you think about that? And I'm just like, the answers are within you. Mm -hmm. I'm not you. I can't tell you. And they're just like, no, I want, I want your opinion. And I'm just like, well, um, you know, we can, we can really work on getting you quieted, getting your noise removed, because that's the only place that we're going to find the answers is within you. And it might be that your path is to take this medication or to take that medication. And, those things were created for a purpose and for a reason. Mm -hmm. And it might be your path that you're supposed to have a half a cup of white rice, or you're supposed to have this vegetable. Like it's okay. Nothing is off the table. Um, It's important to find that inner clarity. Yeah. Right. And I just, I always think of the Knights of the Round Table, like they're all after the Holy grail, right? But they all have to enter the forest in their own spot. You cannot walk somebody else's path. You can be inspired by somebody else's path. You can take some notes that say, that resonate with you and say, hey, I want to try that. But if you, it has to resonate with you and you have to, you have to go after the Holy grail, whatever that is for you in your own, your own way, you have to make your own path there. And it is, in my experience, has been a lot of trial and error. What is it that really helps you stay clear? Do you have, you know, what else nourishes your body, mind, soul and helps you stay, get that clarity? Because that's a long time to live without clarity and brain fog and inflammation. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, Well, and I thought that the healing was over, um, (laughs) but I got a year into um, this way of eating and I was back to work full time. I had uh, so many beautiful, wonderful things happening. And what's so funny is that lens was the only thing that changed. My situations in my life did not change, Mm -hmm. but my lens changed and I was like, oh, we've got this. We've got this. Um, but a year in to eating this way, I had an absolute tragedy happen in my family. Mm-hmm. And what came out of me was um, rage. And I had never experienced this emotion like ever. And so for me to be so clear mentally and then to have this rage and this anger come up, I was just like, what do I do? I'm already eating fatty animal meat. Like, where else do I go? And I called a friend and I said, um, I said, and she was a carnivore friend. And I was like, okay, 
I'm like this, 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 and this happened. I, I want to kill somebody. I'm, I'm angry. W what do I do? I can't, I can't have this hatred in my heart. And she said, go outside at sunrise and put your bare feet on the ground. And I was like, no, I want to kill someone. I'm angry. I'm, you're not listening to me. What do I need to do? What, where do I go? And she said, go outside at sunrise, get your bare eyes in the sun and put your bare feet on the ground. And I was like, <laughs> I was just like, like, I was so mad, like that she yeah. just wasn't hearing me. Yeah. But I, I listened, I listened and God met me. God met me in those mornings. And there it started out like five minutes. And I was like, that was stupid. And then it was like 10 minutes. And then it was just like, then it became my nourishment. It became my favorite part of the day. It became my reset. It became my healing. It became everything to me. Mm -hmm. And I was able to reset. I mean, it felt like a, like a chiropractic alignment. Like I was able to literally align with God and to clear out all of the generational uh, ancestral like stuff. I'm sure there's more to come, but enough for me to operate in love. And it took, a, I would say about a year, a, a year, but I was able to operate in love and I was able to send love to the person who hurt me. And I was able to just process all of this rage, all of this anger and operate in love. Mm -hmm. And it was everything to me. And I never in a million years would have thought that getting my bare eyes in the sunlight and my bare feet on the ground would do that, but it absolutely did. Well, you know, I love that, right? So yeah, naked eyes to the skies, earthing. I mean, it sounds too simple. And I can imagine, and I think practitioners that might be listening, because we don't tend to offer these things up to our clients as much as I think we could, because then our clients are like, I'm telling you, I want to take somebody's head clean off of their body. And you're telling me to go put my bare feet outside. Like, are you on crack? I don't <laughs> know how this is going to help me. And we don't, and I do think sometimes the things that we're taught to come at, you know, to come at these really hard situations in our lives as therapists, as people, we come at it. It feels like we're, we have a little squirt bottle for a fire. Like that is not <laughs> going to do anything, but I promise you these things that return us to the nature that we are reharmonize and what you were doing was actually healing your mitochondria and you were resetting your circadian rhythms and you were also helping your hormones and your neurotransmitters by doing that. So the meat, the fatty meat, it's so helpful for people, but it's not the whole picture. Nope. Nope. And, and I, I recognize now that thank God I had a year under my belt before this tragedy hit. Cause I would have been back in the psych ward. I would have been into, um, alcohol or, or suicidal ideation. Like I would have been off my rocker. So I'm so grateful for that foundation, but I am also grateful that this tragedy happened. Now I see it as a gift now because it refined me. It put me into another level of healing that I didn't even know was necessary or was possible and that it was free and right. that it was, it was literally right outside my door. Like, you, you know, you're waiting on an Amazon package right outside your door. Like the, my healing was delivered right outside my door. And all I had to do was go receive it. Yes. Yeah. And the tragedy, I think there's so many times when you know, the hardest things in our lives bring gifts and to actually experience that. I find that, you know, love and fear, they, like where they bump up against each other is really the juicy places in our lives. And and really birth and death right there. Like there's, they're, 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 
places where it's not an easy place to be, but then place that shapes us the most. Yeah. And I've found like, I can't tell you how many times I have shared Mm -hmm. this story behind closed doors to my clients and they're just like, I never would have known. Mm -hmm. And then they see their tragedy through a different light because I'm able to just show them how to walk through it and to walk in forgiveness. And it, my forgiveness was not for the one who hurt me. My forgiveness was for me, right? Like you can still walk in that selfishness. That's okay. (laughs) Like do it for you. Don't do it for your aggressor, you know, do it for you. And now I do it for the collective because I recognize that they need me whole so that I can be this mouthpiece to share with people, um, hey, there's there's a solution over here and it's super easy and it's super cheap. Um, You know, come here, come here, try this. Mm -hmm. And and that's I, I believe that's why one of the reasons why it happened to me, because spirit knew I was going to just turn around and tell people. (laughs) Yeah, that's the best. You're right. I think that's the whole purpose of the healing and the wholeness is to then be able to pass on the information. I just, you know, I think it's so hard for people to realize the role of forgiveness in love and in, in service to your life. And it's just, it's not an easy thing for people to wrap their brains around. And it's a process. Oh. You said it took you about a year. This is it's, not it's, like a, a week, a weekend. And I'm sure you were actually feeling the benefits of being on the earth's surface and the sunlight. And I want people to also understand it doesn't have to be a sunny day. And nope. all of that. And I live in Missouri. There yeah. were many gray days and I did it year round. Even if it was the only time I didn't do it was when there was actual snow on the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, cause it just hurt my ankles so much, Right. but I would do, I would set a timer and I would do at least 10 minutes, um, every morning, no matter how cold it was. Right. To get the light. And then also you could, your finger, you can touch a tree or a leaf on a bush or something that's planted and still be grounded. So that's the, that's the whole little piece for that. Is there anything else you wanted to say about forgiveness? Is there that you think might be helpful for people who are stuck in a not forgiving place? Well, being the classical or the classic bipolar disorder, I have to go off the deep end. Mm -hmm. Um, And so the only way that I was able to heal was I was able to kind of go on a journey in my mind. And so if I was so angry at this person in my family and I hated them and I I wanted them dead and I had all this anger and I couldn't, I was like, I need to love them. How do I love them? And so I had to go to the extreme and say, how would I love a child molester? Right. And it was just like, and it was so difficult. It took many meditations for me to get to this point. But I realized that I am one with my aggressor and I am one with a child molester. If I am a child molester and a child molester is me, I have to find the common denominator between the two of us so that I can operate in love. And that was so difficult for me because my history is the the way that I started was I started as a two-year-old's teacher. And so I was able to really get into, okay, a child molester, what are they doing? They're trying to bond with another human being. They don't know how they're distorted They don't know how to. And so they are trying to bond with another human being. They are trying to receive love and they are trying in their warped way to give love and to connect in some way. Hmm. And so I was able to go into that meditation and say, I am a child molester 
a child molester is me. I am just one distortion away from a child molester Mm. because I love it. When I would go into my classroom and I would be having a bad day or whatever, I would just sit on the floor and I would get piled on by Mm two-year-olds and they would just play with my hair. They would just like, um, you know, like uh, just sit on my lap and they were just right there and we would sing songs and we would just connect, but there was not a distortion, obviously. So the child molester is, is this horrible, horrible thing for me to imagine. So if I can resonate with, and I can love a child molester, then I can recognize that I can love this aggressor. And so it seems very extreme to go that way, but it it was my path for healing because then I was able to go back to the person who hurt me and go, okay, I can do this. They're not a child molester. Like they're just a person in my family that has hurt me. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to recognize myself in them. Mm -hmm. And realize that we are one and we are the same. And for me to pass any judgment on that family member, I'm just passing it on myself. Right. Yeah. That is an extreme example. It's a hard one to swallow, I think, for people. It's horrible. It's disgusting. But it's the whole thing. That's the whole point of the like self-compassion meditations or compassion meditations in general. You start with something easy usually not the worst, hardest, extreme thing, but something easy. But then you go to something harder to imagine, like somebody you really are having a hard time with. It's just, you know, there's just a lot of static. And if you can send love to that person, if you can start to find the common denominators, your humanity. And I think it takes a lot to see what that person is actually trying to achieve. It's always going to be, we're trying to connect. We're trying to feel love, receive love, be loved and in whatever ways even give love. So yeah, I think that's, that one was, that would be really challenging to, to and it, 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 it's a testament to how much rage I had in me. Like I had so much anger mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. I had to go to this extreme. Um, the only other one I did was a murderer um, because uh, um, I, uh, whenever I, I loved the show Dexter, you mm-hmm. know, where he would just like cut up bodies and stuff like that. And they would have a scene where like the blood would like sling across the the wall, you know? And I'm like, I'm, I, I would never take a life. I would never, you know, be that, but it's interesting to me. And so I am just one distortion away from being a murderer. Mm -hmm. And so if I can love a murderer, then I can love this person. And it was important for me to not have that, um, that anger um, and and to have that forgiveness. Yeah. To carry that, that kind of weight in your own heart is, it's just very hard to do. Yeah. So the work is hard though, right? The, the forgiveness work Ugly. and that it can be very messy and feeling, and you're not saying, oh, I completely agree with and condone any no. of it. It's totally different. The distortion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the thing that people trips people up around forgiveness work, right? It's different. Because they want to be right. They want to be right. And I mean, I could sit here and tell you all day long what what this person did and and I'm right and they're wrong. But at the end of the day, um, what is right is forgiveness. What is right is love. Boundaries. Oh my gosh, do we have boundaries? But I had to change the way my heart was and my heart was enraged and I had to get love in my heart. And that was that was the answer. Right. Because rage in the heart, those stuffed emotions are the things that were like, oh, no, 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 I can't feel this way. This is bad. Whatever it is, if you shove it, you will get symptoms. Like that is guaranteed that you are going to build more inflammation and you will end up with some sort of disease. It will manifest somewhere. So not something you want to carry around and shove down and 
And sometimes the rage is so prominent that you couldn't shove it down even if you tried and you don't want it to leak out on other people, the innocent people in your family and around you. So there's there's that piece too. So you nourish yourself with lots of fatty meat. You're an earthing sunrise person too. Is there anything else that you find that really nourishes your body, mind, soul? Um, well, I think it, it kind of ties in with my time uh, in the morning, but it's it's meditation. Um, I think so many times we um, we go to God and it's like we're picking up the phone and we're like, I need this. I need that. I need this. I need that. And and can you, you got to work in this. And, and what should I do in this situation? Blah, blah, blah. And we're talking on the phone. What we need to do is pick up the phone and just listen. Mm -hmm. Right. And just shut up. Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. So that silence with God, um, it, that that's where I got all of these ideas that Kate, I didn't, I didn't come up with how, how do I love my uh, abusive uh, family member? I, I learned how to love a child molester. Right. Like who would come up with that? God gave me that. God, mm -hmm. and, it, and it was, it was degrees. It took me a while to get to that point. Um, but it unlocked something and it set me free free. And so picking up the phone and really doing that quiet meditation and just listening, it was really important for me. And I just am, it's, it's not something I would expect from somebody who spent so many years in bipolar episodes to be able to be quiet and just listen into stillness, because that is something, I mean, that alone is hard that's hard for any brain. So that's really amazing that you've been able to come to this place of listening meditations. I mean, yeah. listening in silence, <laughs> listening to God speak to you or whatever somebody wants to, whatever handle verse, life force, whatever it is. Well, and it was interesting because what had to come through or what did come through first mm -hmm. was still a lot of like negative self-talk. Mm -hmm. um, and so to sit there and just listen to that at first was difficult. And I get why people are not quiet because the messages that come through at first is not God. <laughs> it's you're lazy. It's your, you failed at this and you didn't do this. And so-and-so hates you and blah, 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 blah. And I, I just, I had to just sit through that mm. and, and really like recognize that, okay, this is not the way God talks to me. God doesn't talk to me like this. This is, this is an illusion. This is something else. I need to let it process and to listen to that negative talk for a while um, and then get to the good stuff, then get to the, oh, baby girl, I am so proud of you. Oh my gosh. You were just such a, a bright light in this world. And I, I'm, I'm so, uh, you know, it just in awe of your brilliance, like just get getting to that place. And now I'm a, addicted. Like, I love it. I love just getting into that quiet moment with God spirit, whatever you want to call it, where I just, I just get to breathe. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. Cause I think people give up like, well, obviously it worked for Emily, but that's not working for me. So to, to let people know that there was a time that all the self negative self-talk emerged first. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, I mean, that's really been happening for me a lot lately too. The more I practice self-love, the more I recognize the self-criticism it's like, oh, I wouldn't have thought that I spent so much time in fear, but that goes in that thought goes in the fear bucket, and that thought is a love thought, and that's what you know. And that bucket of fear is a lot more full than I would have ever expected when you actually start just practicing, but then staying really gentle with yourself to stay the stay the course. Well, and I think it's, it's, it's our whole conditioning. It's our society. Um, we are driven by fear. Um, we are driven by, you got to get the A, you, you got to do your, your quota for the job. And if you don't, and, and I remember whenever I stepped out of that anxiety, I had no motivation. 
to do anything because I realized that it was all an illusion. And I realized that uh, I'm enough as I am. I don't have to get out of bed. And I don't have, I remember my dad goes, are you depressed? And I go, no, I said, I'm so happy. I said, I'm good. I said, I'm really good. And he was like, yeah, he was like, but I just, I noticed that, you know, you, you said you didn't do anything today. And I'm like, I didn't, I just, I just let myself be. And eventually I, I got out of that, but it was just like, like whenever you're going from being a carb and a sugar burner to being a fat burner, you're switching systems. And so to go from being a, an anxiety and fear driven to being love driven, you're switching systems. And so it takes a minute to kind of like turn that around. Right. Great point. Yeah. <laughs> Give yourself some grace while you turn that ship around. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have absolutely loved talking to you. Was there anything else you really wanted to share with people? Did we get to everything? No, I just thank you so much because um, I can sit here and tell people my story, but whenever you put the science behind it and you put the research behind it, um, it, it just validates everything that I'm experiencing. And I went to one of your workshops and I was literally just like beaming. I was just like, yes, like, cause I didn't know that there was so much science behind all of this. There was so much explanation. And so everything that you offer helps so many people to, to really not have to go and just take my word for it. Like they can literally see the, the, the reasoning behind it. So I love what you're doing. Oh, that's very sweet of you. I appreciate it. And the truth is we don't need to wait for science to catch up. If something feels good, if you can feel it, it feels like love. And the way God speaks to us is always super, super, super kind. So if it's not that, then it's not, that is not it. So I really appreciate you saying that because I think we're getting, the science is catching up, but these are, these are such simple things. So I hope that people will go try it for themselves. Right. And you give, so yeah, you give people so much hope to come from where you were and people can come follow you and see, like you can see the pictures, you can see the light coming back into you. So I appreciate you sharing your story and being the bright light that you are and I look forward to the next time I get to see you. Awesome. Sounds good. I'll have to come visit you in Florida. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Emily. Great. Right. Bye.